Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Invictus Games Foundation Conversation, uh, which brings you together to share the Invictus spirit and to activate the incredible network of people across all the participating nations in support of each other. I'm David Richmond, and I will facilitate the conversation today. I thoroughly enjoyed 26 years of service as an infantry officer, which came to an end when I was seriously wounded while commanding the officer of the UK battle group in Musakala in Afghanistan in 2000. Uh, I underwent four years of reconstructive surgery and rehab, and when I was medically discharged, I joined the UK charity Help for Heroes as their first director of recovery. And I spent the next six years uh, creating and running their recovery services for the United Kingdom's wounded, injured and sick, and crucially their families too. And we worked in close partnership with the Ministry of Defence, other charity and private sector partners. I've been privileged to be involved with the Invictus Games since the London Games in 2014, as part of the UK team leadership. And I was lucky enough to be part of the UK Partnership Board for the Games in Orlando in 2016 and Toronto in 2017, where I had specific responsibility for the team. I've seen at first hand the incredible power and the catalytic effect of the Games on competitors, family and friends, and the wider public. And I'm delighted to be involved again today. We really do have a great program for you this afternoon with a series of expert speakers who are keen to share their knowledge with you and to answer your questions. So please ask lots of questions using either the chat function or the question and answer function, both of which you'll find a button for at the bottom of your screen. And share any thoughts or ideas you have on the chat function too, please. Today really is about sharing and starting conversations and supporting each other. So let's take full advantage of this opportunity. Please can I ask also that if you do ask a question via chat or Q&A, that you introduce yourself, giving us your name, your position, which could be as a competitor or the role that you fill in the team, and your nation at the start of your question. I'll be supported by a team in the background, Sam and Hannah, who will keep the technology working and also help me sift through the questions that you send in. Over the course of the panels, I will put a selection of them to the panel members, and any we don't manage to answer today, verbally, we will save and provide written answers to you over the next few days. There'll be a number of polls that will be run in the background, and you may have seen one already, that Sam and Hannah will pop onto Zoom through the afternoon. Please take part, as your input is really valuable to us. In terms of what you'll see on the screen, you will either see me, more's the pity, I can hear some of you say, or the speaker, or the speaker and the slides on the screen. You may also just see a slide from time to time. You won't see yourself, but please don't worry about that. Be assured that you are here and that we will be able to read any questions you put on the question and answer function or via chat. The event is also being recorded and you will all receive a copy over the coming days via email and it will also be popped on our website, the Invictus Games Foundation website. The Invictus Games Foundation Data Protection and Privacy Policy, for those of you who may be interested, is on the website. Uh, and if you would prefer not to be recorded, then please only use the chat or the Q&A functions. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dominic Reed. Dominic is the Chief Executive Officer of the Invictus Games Foundation and has been involved with the Games since its inception in 2014. Dominic, welcome. Uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Um... David, thank you very much indeed for, for hosting this and for doing such a great job. It's my task to welcome you all uh, very warmly to this, the first thing that the IGF are doing virtually. Um, I was involved right at the outset with the Invictus Games in London in 2014. I was the uh, project, I was the event director, so I was responsible for making the competition happen. And uh, I was then asked to set up the foundation uh, in, in early 2015 to make this thing happen again and again. When we started, we didn't know what we were creating. We didn't know whether it was going to go on and run over a number of years. We thought we were putting on a special event for a special purpose, but it's turned into something more than that. It's turned into an international community. It's turned into, if you like, an Invictus family. And this is the first real gathering of that family online. And the, the fantastic thing is that despite the situation we all find ourselves in with COVID, here we are, um, with as many people involved today as would have been if we'd been gathering together um, in, in The Hague. So whilst we're all sad that we can't be in The Hague and we can't be at the Games today, which is where we should be, uh, we are involving and reaching as many people, if not more, than we would have done. So um, this is an opportunity to bring together best practice, to share the Invictus spirit, to share thoughts and ideas, 
to support one another um, and, and to give friendship, to give mutual support um, and, and to work together uh, to create and, and to further and to, and to, and to uh, allow the Invicta spirit to flourish internationally. So I'm really glad that everybody could join us. Um, I'm now going to uh, hand over for a series of videos from important people, from our patron, the Duke of Sussex, from the Honourable Tony Abbott, who is, as you know, a former Prime Minister of Australia, but also the patron of ISPS Handa, one of our partners, um, and to Ank Bieleveld Schuten, who is the Minister of Defence from the Netherlands. And I'd like to uh, just finish my introduction by thanking those people who are supporting us in this endeavour. Ascot Rehab, the Fisher House Foundation, who've been with us since the very beginning, uh, as have ISPS Handa. Thank you all very much. Hello everybody, um, I'm really happy to be able to welcome you all here today for the first ever Invictus Games Foundation conversation. We're obviously not in The Hague, but I'm so pleased that we've been able to organise this virtual gathering uh, when the Games would have taken place themselves. This conversation is all about sharing the Invictus spirit, and it is even more relevant now as we are having to address new challenges and adapt our lives. I hope that all the nations, competitors and family and friends are coping well and supporting each other through this time. And I know you'll be showing that resilience, which is so central to the Invictus community. I'm very grateful to all of you for being here and for showing your support, uh, specifically the speakers and the panelists for sharing their expertise uh, and experiences. I hope that this conversation will be the first of many, and I really look forward to a time when we can come together again. Enjoy, and thank you very much. We all owe a debt of honour to the members of our armed forces. and We owe a particular debt to those who have been wounded in the service of our country. And that's why the Invictus Games movement should be so enthusiastically supported by all of us. Sport, as you know, is a wonderful way to make friends, to build character and to help restore souls. And the Invictus Games have helped thousands and thousands of veterans again to believe in themselves. Now, naturally, we're all shattered that the Games can't go ahead this year, like so much that the pandemic has upended. And it goes against the grain to be locked down for our own safety. Uh, for people who have been so active in defence of our country, I suspect it could be especially irksome to be passive for our own good. I feel that way, uh, and you may too. Still, it is what it is, and we just have to make the most of this quiet time to draw close to our families and friends and to find meaning and purpose in a more inward life. I hope it will be some consolation to the whole Invictus movement that its supporters are still helping even in these hard times. Whatever else may change, I'm sure Invictus will always be an anchor for Prince Harry. And one of your biggest backers, Dr. Hander, has promised me that he will stand by these games despite the postponement because he believes in the power of sport and he knows how much it means to you. Dr. Hander has been supporting sport, especially disability sport, ever since being impressed many years ago by a blind golfer. His view then as now as it is that we should focus not on what we can't do, but on what we can do. To strive, to seek, to find and not to yield, that is the wonderful spirit of these games. And I know that those who were unconquerable in military service will never be subdued by a mere virus. So our challenge is to use this time as well as we can, knowing that this too will pass and to emerge next year stronger than ever. So keep training, keep pushing yourself, and I hope to see you in The Hague in 2021, we only have 12 months to wait. 
I'm Anne Beilefeld Schouten, the Minister of Defence of the Netherlands. For everyone involved, it's incredibly disappointing that this year's Invictus Games can't take place. It is an event that everyone was looking forward to with great anticipation. However, we are confident that you will be able to cope with your disappointment and will come out of this situation even stronger than before. Because that is what Invictus is all about. Resilience. And you have already proven that you are resilient. We hope that despite this long break in which we are limited in what we can do, you can continue to set targets for yourselves and that you will continue to support each other. Because that remains incredibly important. Stay safe. Thank you to Dominic, to our patron, to the Honourable Tony Abbott and Anka for your messages of support and encouragement. As you are all acutely aware, we were due to be at the Hague right now competing in the Invictus Games 2020. We will all have to wait a year, but it's timely now to introduce Mark de Croif, who is the chairman of the Invictus Games, the Hague 2020. Mark was a Lieutenant General in the Royal Netherlands Army and from October 2011, to March 2016 was commanding officer of their land forces. He also commanded the 45,000 strong NATO force in southern Afghanistan. Mark, welcome, uh, and we look forward to hearing you uh, speak. Thank you very much. Uh, dear friends, as uh, chairman of the foundation that organizes the Invictus Games 2020 in The Hague, we now should have been meeting each other at the Zuiderpark in The Hague, enjoying the games, but it was not to happen. But you, as part of the Invictus Games community, know better than anyone else that we only have limited control of our lives. We were, are, and will be confronted with situations and impacts that will surprise us, strike us off balance, and sometimes hurt us. Perhaps the Invictus Games spirit can act as an example to show the world that resilience, Trust in the endless power of the human being and unconditional friendship can help us to overcome nearly every crisis. In that spirit, I can share with you that cancelling the Invictus Games was a tough decision with a huge impact. But in line with celebrating 75 years of freedom, I would like to say we lost a battle, but not a war. As we speak, we worked tirelessly to set the conditions for organizing the Invictus Games in the May-June period next year, and we are making tremendous progress. Therefore, it is far from wishful thinking that I hope to come back to you in a couple of weeks from now <laughs> and share some good news. In the meantime, I'm thrilled to be able to meet you all in this webinar. I would like to thank you all for your support. We are Invictus. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we'll now start. <clears throat> excuse me. We'll now start our first session and enjoy a series of video messages from our participation participating nations. Uh, please sit back just now and enjoy the videos. G'day, Wayne Kelly, Australian Team Manager. Adversity isn't new to our competitors, and the current COVID-19 crisis presents another challenge to overcome. While disappointed the games have been postponed to 2021, this has provided a focus for our competitors to continue training while observing isolation restrictions. Obviously, training for team sports isn't possible in the current circumstances. So we're focusing on individual skills and personal fitness. Our coaches maintain regular contact with the competitors to assist them in developing bespoke training programs for their multiple sports. We've created a Zwift cycling group to allow our cyclists to continue to train with their teammates in a virtual setting. This has been well received with regular rides established, making sure that the cycling group stays connected while apart. Our team captains, Shane and Sarah, have instituted a regular video communique to keep the team informed of developments and how individuals are progressing with their training until we can come together again as a team. They've been fantastic and really embracing their roles as team captains. Finally, competitors, family and friends and staff from Team Australia send their very best wishes 
to the organising staff of the host nation and to all participating nations, including their competitors, family and friends and staff. As we navigate our way through the COVID-19 pandemic, we hope you all stay safe and well, and we look forward to seeing you at the Invictus Games in The Hague in 2021. Good day, eh? Team Canada here. We remain strong knowing that although we are apart, we're not alone. Together, we are stronger. My teammates have my back and I have theirs. We continue to train, sharing a growth and success with each other. Together, we are unconquered. Hello, Team Canada. Like all other nations, we will be stronger and more resilient at the Invictus game. Stay strong. Together, we are Invictus. Hello everybody, my name is Klaus Bodilsen, I'm the Danish team manager. Um, our guys, they are right now training by themselves, taking it easy and then we will uh, accelerate in August and starting our training camps again. Uh, the guys are coping so well with this uh, corona situation and which is uh, due to our personal development program. So if any of you are interested in, in, in learning about how we're doing it or need help to set up your own uh, program, then please get in touch with me. I'm looking forward to seeing you all again and stay safe. Bye. There it is today, My name is Margus and I represent Team Estonia. Yes, uh, our small nation is doing great, uh, and of course we had to postpone our pre-Invictus uh, training camp. But now the situation is uh, going better, and two thirds of our team is going to have training camp uh, at the end of May. Uh, our veterans did individual trainings, and now it is allowed to go outside again uh, and uh, train in small groups up to ten people. Compared to uh, other nations, I think we are uh, doing very well uh, in this uh, situation. And uh, I, I think that the pandemic in Estonia is, is under control. Uh, by example, our football league will uh, continue next week with the official games. And I think that is always a good sign when football is coming back. So my advice to you is think and stay positive. Train hard and see you in Hague next year. Hello to all. I am Michael Ranchin, captain of the French team. This strange period affects all of us, but we must remain united and take care of each other. We must continue to train and rebuild ourselves, each on our side for the moment, but soon all together. On behalf of the world team, we wish you the best. Stay safe and at home. And look forward to all of you meeting. My name is Bubal Lumashvili, Head of Social Issues and Psychological Support Department within the Ministry of Defence of Georgia. One of the main tasks of my department is to take care of Georgian wounded warriors. All recommendations coming from WHO is taken into our account and our Invictus team is staying at home with their family members. Rehabilitation team and trainers offer them special instruction in order to keep their physical condition. So we are looking forward to meet you in Hague in 2021. Wishing you healthiness. Goodbye. Ciao amici e colleghi da tutto il mondo. My name is Mattia, first sergeant, Carabinieri Corps. Member of the Italian team at the Invictus 2020. While training at home, I'm following a bodyweight fit workout called Insanity. Depression started in Afghanistan during my 2012 deployment. One of my goals is to reach the same amount of push-ups I could make before my accident, yet now with one hand only. This pandemic crisis keeps evolving, and it's still time to hold the line. Follow the authorities' instructions, stay safe, and we'll overcome these dark times all together as one. See you soon. Tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou whānau mā. Kia ora, my name is Jason Rapana, and I'm a proud member of the New Zealand Invictus team. Our team and families are in great spirits and continue to prepare for the Games. The New Zealand Invictus team wishes you and your families well. Stay safe, stay strong and stay united. We are Invictus.
Dear Foundation, veterans, soldiers, staff and friends, my name is Colonel Szczepan Gustak, Director of the Center of Veterans Affairs from Poland. My office is responsible for provision and advice in near comprehensive assistance to military veterans who has taken part in overseas operations since 1953. We are also responsible for education about our engagement in combat and memory of our fallen soldiers. Since the beginning of our presence in Invictus Games, we take care of Polish national team. On behalf of our athletes, I would like to thank you for rescheduling the competition to 2021. We promise that this time will not be wasted. We are in permanent training. Despite of COVID-19, our team members practice individually every single day. We will be ready. We are looking forward to see you next year in Hack. Take care and God bless you. 안녕하세요. Representing Team Korea, I am Hyun Gyu Moon, Manager for International Affairs of Korea Disabled Veterans Post Council. Coping with COVID-19, we have taken strict social distancing measures, so our camp training for high performance remain suspended, but our competitors are having individual training to maintain their fitness with our help. If the situation is fully improved, our camp training will be resumed. We do really hope each of you can take good care of yourselves and see you all in good health in Hague in 2021. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'm Honora Sava Salut. My name is Gabriel Union and I represent Team Romania. Romanian wounded warriors currently act on Prince Harry's advice and maintain focus on the training activities. In these pandemic days, they grow strong at home as much as they are able to improve their physical condition. Although it is hard and exhausting, they speak for the Invictus generation and all of them make the impossible possible. We are very enthusiastic about our role in 2021 Invictus Games. Until we get the chance to see you again, stay safe, train hard and take care of your mind and body. Go Invictus! Hi, my name is Oksana, I'm team manager for Ukraine. So in terms of preparations, Team Ukraine continues training. Each team member has their own individual training plan and works directly with their coach. We also plan to hold several sport events for the team members and with the team members so they get engaged with other veterans, they can train together and compete. They also have access to psychological support as uh, this quarantine was a challenge uh, both mentally and physically. However, I have to say that the best support that was provided was the support provided by veteran community, both national and international. And I have to say that I'm really, really proud of my team and the support that my team members provide to each other. I really hope to see them soon. I also hope to see you and you stay safe. Team UK have taken the postponement as an opportunity and are seeing as a positive that they have another 12 months to make the best of their recovery journeys and to be as physically and mentally fit as possible come games time next year. The team are in great spirits and have kept in regular contact with each other, offering support and friendship. Team UK coaches have been giving advice as to how to stay fit and healthy, as well as some exercises to do safely whilst we're in lockdown. We hope to continue our training camps as soon as it is safe to do so. The Invictus UK charities Help for Heroes and the Royal British Legion are offering any further support which may be needed. I am really proud of everyone's positive attitude and continued commitment to reach their personal recovery goals. Team UK will be as strong as ever come the Games next year. Hello Invictus family, my name is Joshua Smith, co-captain for Team US. I hope wounded warriors and nations are doing well and the best that you can to persevere this coronavirus pandemic. Continue with training and prep for the games and being resilient. We can reach out to each other through social media, texts, and phone calls. We can do this as nations come together and embrace one another with encouragement and support. Netherlands, I hope you're ready. We're coming to The Hague for an amazing experience in 2021. Thank you to everyone involved in creating those messages, which bring home to us all the uh, Invictus spirit and the great community that exists amongst all the Invictus nations, their competitors, their friends and their families. I'll just take this opportunity before we move into our first speakers, just to remind you all to use the chat function to share your thoughts and your ideas uh, and to develop a conversation as we go through today. It's now time to introduce and to hear from our first speakers on the topic 
uh, of the impact and legacy of the Invictus Games. You'll hear from both speakers, uh, who I will introduce in a moment, and then there will be a panel session where they will answer any questions that you have. The first speaker is Dr. Blair Evans, who is an assistant professor at Pennsylvania State University. Blair studies the psychology of physical activity. Based on the observation that groups and social interactions are inherent to everyday life, he examines how our relationships with other people influence our well-being and health behaviors. Understanding why and how the Invictus Games helps in the long-term recovery of the wounded, injured and sick, veterans, servicemen and their families is vitally important in enabling the Games to continually be developed and to enhance the competitors' experience every time. It's no longer sufficient these days simply to say it helps, you need to be able to prove it. Blair will speak about his research findings on the impact being identified on Invictus Games competitors in their recovery and rehabilitation through participation in the Games and the lessons and best practice they have identified. Blair, welcome. We look here forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. I will, uh, I will start by, uh, by getting the presentation shared. So, okay. So hopefully uh, you are all seeing, uh, seeing the presentation. I'm thrilled to be here today, everybody. It's an honor to present a subset of key insights uh, from ongoing research examining some of the lessons learned from nations involved uh, with the Invictus Games. Uh, we're going to highlight especially um, insights from, from nations regarding how they foster positive, cohesive, and meaningful sport experiences uh, related to the Games. Now, I will acknowledge I'm perhaps more of a role player in the team that's brought these findings to light. Um, in many ways, Selena Shrazapur is a star uh, behind, this, behind the scenes, has led this work, um, although a personal matter made it impossible for her to present today. She is available at any point in time to especially to elaborate on some of these things and would love to, to have you reach out to her. Um, now, before getting started, it is critical to note that the research presented today has been funded by the Forces in Mind Trust, a 35 million pound funding scheme uh, run by the trust using an endowment uh, awarded to the big, uh, the big lottery fund. Now, as, as was acknowledged on many of the calls earlier today, uh, military personnel with illnesses and injuries tend to experience barriers to their physical activity involvement. And there's certainly an imperative to promote sport and recreation programs, which are now widespread strategies to support rehabilitation uh, military personnel. And, and as you know, many of the speakers earlier uh, this morning indicated, these programs can really carry potential uh, psychological and social benefits as well. But there are really two critical gaps that guide, uh, guide our work. First of all, that's that research hasn't in any detailed way really looked into some of the benefits of long-term sport involvement on the, the long-term horizon, uh, some of the things that might emerge over time and that we could test through well-designed studies. Then also there's been limited investigation of what strategies are used within programs that really effectively promote some of these long-term benefits. Uh, some of the best practices. So really largely many of these types of uh, programming opportunities, uh, we definitely need to focus on really the practices that are, that are demonstrated in effective programs. Um, with that said, I think, um, and especially looking at many of Selena's, uh, much of Selena's research that she's conducted through surveys and through um, interviews with nations and competitors, uh, one major focus has been on the long-term impact of the Invictus Games on competitor well-being. And certainly one athlete indicated, you know, I know it sounds bizarre, um, but the, the sport came second for most of us. Purely because we all miss the camaraderie, the banter, and the cohesion uh, that we experienced within the service, um, to, to get that back was, it is uh, phenomenal. Um, so, uh, so really that type of experience really highlights some of the focus that we're gonna talk about here today. Um, but the second point, and that's what we're really gonna focus on today, are really around the different strategies and best practices that might be able to be used by all nations. And we're, we're gonna focus on some today that, that have been highlighted by nations. And of course, within any given context, it's, it might differ according to resources, um, or by different uh, by availability and things like that. But 
but ultimately we hope that many of the things we'll share today could be applied to some extent uh, from one nation to the other. Um, and I will identify also that this should be coached. Uh, we coached our work within the quality participation framework. That we is on uh, many of these building key elements behind positive experience. It really helps define what a positive experience is. And many uh, competitors and nations, when they talk about their best uh, sport experiences, tend to focus on the experiences of belonging, autonomy, mastery, challenge, engagement, and meaning. We're going to focus especially today on belonging, mastery, and meaning, and especially on those foundational strategies used within uh, many of the used by nations to try to promote these types of experiences. Belonging, this can be seen at many different levels within a team and even at a much broader level within the, the Invictus family as a whole. Um, and many of the nations that talked about their strategies to build uh, belongingness, first of all, talked about facilitating green team and group connections. Now, even amongst those uh, countries that can't create uh, specific teams of athletes, uh, they found ways to try to create teams with other nations. And some of these teams were actually those that received perhaps the most support, a uh, pile of support um, at the games from, from uh, spectators. Another strategy, especially as, as countries are getting more and more uh, geographically dispersed um, in terms of the programming from one side of the country to the other, finding ways to promote interactions between training camps is key. And especially we see that nowadays during COVID. Um, so some of the strategies might involve using uh, video re videos related to training um, and also using uh, strategies such as uh, online chat groups and the like. And then also family is a big part to this. Um, nations that have integrated family did so such as uh, through strategies like um, integrating family within training camps, maybe providing accommodations or the opportunity for accommodation and also doing things uh, like maybe at a training camp, including a family meal or a friendly competition uh, where those people uh, who are family members can experience the games, maybe get connected with other family members and to really get a sense of what the competitor experience is like. Now in terms of mastery, this relates to basically a sense of achievement. Um, now, of course, on one hand, athletes sometimes experience mixed messages from their own nations or from their teammates about the importance of competition, but certainly a major goal really focuses on uh, the broader impact and helping develop a sense of achievement and mastery that can be after the games. And so one of the types of strategies that organizations and nations uh, use to promote this uh, type of outcome is by having specific discussions um, where you actually set aside a time for teams um, and including coaches and talking about what next and having a discussion about, hey, here are the, my goals for what I'm gonna get out of the games. In terms of meaning, this very much focuses around the idea that often individuals gain a big part of their identity through the, the, the games experience. And so this, uh, you know, in this area, we're really gonna focus on those people who actually uh, are no longer involved in the games. And nations often spoke about opportunities for former competitors uh, to gain experiences so they can maintain that identity as a competitor at the games. And so, some of the ways that they did this was perhaps by providing opportunities for those to bring those people on as coaches, uh, maybe to bring them on as formal mentors that actually travel with the team to the games, uh, or maybe even informal mentors that maybe uh, attend training camps or get connected with, uh, with uh, new competitors. And then another big focus that's, that can get uh, kind of left behind, but many nations, especially when they talked about some selection process, is what to do and how do you support those people who aren't selected to be competitors? There are a number of strategies around this that were really promising. Um, first of all, um, organizations, nations provided at times opportunities to train with the team or to participate in sport events. Um, now, a really critical point here is that for those people who are invited to participate and train with the team, that, they, they're, that they're clear what the selection process is, so that they might not get those uh, wires crossed. Another opportunity is to provide ways to maybe bring those who don't make the team to the games, maybe uh, through the family and friends allotment. And then also another strategy is really referring non-competitors to other existing sport opportunities that might be outside of the Invictus family, 
but having some uh, pipeline into other available, available programs in their community. Now across all of this, communication is critical, especially when people are deselected from a team, providing personal feedback about why that happened, uh, making it really clear, and ultimately making it really clear that the Invictus family can be quite broad and, and making sure that that sense is gained by non-competitors um, has been described as being really important, not only by nations, but also by competitors during, um, during our interviews and surveys with them. So kind of if you try to think about the main points from today, um, I think the main message is we're really starting to learn from nations that are developing strategies to support physical and psychosocial recovery. Many of the key strategies used by nations really focused around strategies related to building belongingness, mastery, and meaning. And uh, one of the most exciting aspects is really strategies around integrating non-competitors. And also recognizing that many of the things that we talked about today are of course adaptable based on geographic size, number of competitors, or even program budget. Ultimately though, another key point that Selena wanted me to share is that research is continuing. So uh, we pushed a survey out through the end of May. So please reach out to survey if you have not, uh, Selena, if you have not received any survey links. We really appreciate all the nations for ongoing support and participation. Um, and, and I've also uh, posted Selena's uh, contact information here. So thank you. Thank you, Blair. Um, Blair will take questions during the panel session in a few minutes. And we've had some questions popping up on the Q&A box and also some really interesting comments on the chat. So thank you for, for popping those on. And we'll return to those in due course. Um, I'd next like to introduce Ben Rahili. Ben was the Chief Operating Officer of the Organising Committee for the Invictus Games in Sydney. He is a former Naval Officer who has worked for Deloitte since 2012. In 2014, he and injured Wallaby captain uh, Stephen Moore conceived of the idea to take the Invictus Games to Australia and worked on the Games from feasibility before being seconded to it as the Chief Operating Officer. A key component to any bid to host the Invictus Games is the legacy that the Games will leave behind. How the Games will positively impact the lives of local people long after the closing ceremony and after the competitors and the officials have all returned home. Ben is going to tell us about the Invictus Games Sydney Legacy Programme and the impact it has had. Ben, welcome. Uh, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, and, and thank you very much for, for having me. Um, uh, pleased to be here, and uh, let me just share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that, and I thought, uh, if possible, I'll start with um, a, vi a video to remind us all of the Sydney Games. The Invictus generation is defining what it means to serve. It's your privilege to watch in the stands or with your friends and families around the television. Show the world what Game On Down Under really means. This is St. Victor's Game Sydney. All of this, all the people, all the kids cheering everyone on. It's amazing. And what these people all can do, it's bringing out a lot. A lot. You're there to support everyone else, no matter if they're your team or not, if you met them or not. And that's what you think the spirit is. Well, I don't care if I win a medal or not, as long as I finish the race. I'm proud to be here, and it's a big honor to present my nation. Every minute has been just such a, a life-altering experience. The Invictus Games for me is respect, camaraderie and mateship and also to be always learning. It's a celebration of the phenomenal human spirit. This is my chance to course correct. This is something, something great, something awesome and this is new sports for me. Get out of the house and take care of yourself and be the special person that you can be. You are the Invictus generation and you are showing us all that anything is possible.
today, um, what I really wanted to focus on is the broader benefits of games, what I often call, whilst we're delivering the games, the, the ripple effects of, of the games. These games um, have, all, all events have, have a high profile and, and create a moment in time. But the Invictus games have a disproportionate profile and therefore a disproportionate potential to, to drive social change. Um, to try and quantify some of that, the Sydney games uh, reached a, a UK and Australian metropolitan TV audience of 25 million um, with 150 hours of, of total broadcast um, across, those, across the, those two nations uh, alone. Um, the, the slide I have here depicts some of the amazing characters, people who have a you know, high profile in, in Australian public life, who decided to become actively involved with the games and lend their profile to the games. High profile sportsmen and women, um, but perhaps more importantly than the high profile sportsmen and women is the, um, the, the, the individuals who have had a direct impact on Australia's national policy settings. So uh, Darren Chester, the Minister for Veterans um, Affairs, uh, Mark Binskin, one of our board members, but Chief of Defence Force at the time, the Governor General, uh, the Prime Minister depicted alongside the patron, uh, the then Governor of New South Wales, um, and now, now our Head of State in, in Australia. Um, all came together to support the Games and were therefore able to actively influence um, legacy initiatives uh, as an outcome. The Invictus Games come, with the profile comes a lot of hoopla. That can be treated as either as a distraction to, to the core event of delivering a sporting event for, for the competitors um, or an opportunity. And we, from a very early, early stage in the Sydney Games, decided to treat that as op an opportunity to drive social change. Um, if I quote Darren Chester, the, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, you know, when he was asked why he out, um, got so actively involved in the Games, chairing individually chairing one of our working groups, he said, it's not often as a, as a minister that the, 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 the story of the day becomes yours for, for seven days running and therefore the opportunity to drive change. But it's not just the profile of the Games that lends it the opportunity to, to drive social change. Um, it's the fact that it requires all three levels of government to cooperate, corporates um, and the charity sectors. And for example, I would regularly chair um, a, a working group that involved those three entities, um, forging sort of habits of cooperation um, across the spectrum that, that lasted beyond the Games. If I turn now to the, to the next slide, um, what I'd like to do now is talk about how we drove uh, the legacy outcomes across the Games. Um, as, as I said, from the get-go, we prioritise the importance urgency of the legacy setting. We spent a lot of time with stakeholders defining what we call the enduring benefit of the games um, and, and put this into our uh, business uh, case that became our pitch document to the Invictus Games Foundation. We said we, in that we said we wanted to increase veteran involvement in sport, we wanted to increase public support for veterans, um, we wanted to um, increase the awareness and support for adaptive sports more generally. Um, and we wanted to create a more coherent ex-service organisation community. The Australian ex-service organisation committee is sort of characterised by great enthusiasm, perhaps not a huge amount of coordination. If we then turn to delivery um, and what we did sort of through the two year planning cycle, we attempted to keep ourselves focused on, on delivering the games on delivering legacy outcomes. We stood up a leg legacy subcommittee of the board um, that decided how to prioritise the legacy initiatives. And if we turn to the next slide, um, we, we regularly measured ourselves back against those legacy outcomes. You can see here um, what we famously called the wrist wheel, but we identified our key success factors. Um, uh, and and we, you know, we spent a lot of time working these with both the Invictus Games Foundation and, and our board and, and stakeholders. And we identified the risks of delivery around those key success factors. But right in the heart of what you see there is our legacy, uh, desired legacy outcomes. But regularly as a senior leadership team within the organising committee, we'd measure ourselves back to our legacy committee, our legacy um, desired outcomes almost on a, on a weekly basis. We were conscious of our size as, a, as, a, as an organising committee. Um, and so we deliberately created relationships with like-minded charities, what we called our communications partner program, who could amplify our message, but also leverage our brand to extend their, to extend their messaging. And we use these relationships to create uh, moments in time across the two year delivery cycle, uh, where we increase community engagement and, and enhanced our legacy message. We also, you know, one, one of the great lessons was, we learned the importance of uh, 
having a legacy or an enduring benefit during commercial discussions with, with partners um, who you know, really were interested in what that legacy outcome would be rather than perhaps just the seven days of the game. Then at games time, we did much more than deliver the games. The games were always our crown jewels. The competitor experience was always at the heart of everything we were trying to do. But we did a number of other things and we had a number of other initiatives. We had a student program. So 10,000 students from across New South Wales visited the games and engaged with the games. We had an outreach program. So we facilitated nine events, all hosted by third parties um, and all supporting what we called a, a daily theme. So, so the Monday of the games was all about the power of education. Um, Tuesday was about the power of sport, uh, Wednesday volunteering, Thursday wellness, and on, the, and on our penultimate day, uh, a Veterans Day. Um, and each of those, we had a number of, each of those events came with an announceable legacy, sort of tangible initiative. Um, from the University of New South Wales announcing on the Monday that they, they were standing up a veteran scholarship, um, a corporate support, JB Weir announced uh, continued research and support into volunteering, but most importantly, and on that final day, the Veterans for Minister, uh, Veterans for Minister, uh, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, I should say, um, and announced the standing up of the Veterans Sport, uh, Veterans Sport Australia, um, supported by um, uh, the, uh, uh, a surplus of funding that we created during the, the delivery of the games. We integrated both the student program and the out, outreach program with all the broader, or broader activities within the game. So the um, messages were in, inculcated into sports presentation. The hospitality area, for example, was named number 28, um, the, October the 28th being the closing day of the ceremony. And each of the events on a daily basis were aimed at supporting the, the messaging around, around the outcome. How did we go then in terms of, of delivering a, a legacy outcome? Um, as I said, we used a surplus to stand up Veterans Sport Australia, um, which has become the peak body for veterans um, activity in sport, um, supporting both uh, a day-to-day -day involvement in sport, but also pathways through to events like, like the Invictus Games um, in collaboration with the Australian Defence Force and the Return Services League. Um, really, that focuses on unlocking the potential for the 70-odd thousand sporting clubs in Australia to support veterans maintain an active and healthy lifestyle. Um, and this really allowed us to sort of bridge a gap um, of some of the, some of the um, gaps that we identified as the host organising committee hosting a home games in the veteran, uh, veteran sporting experience. Um, and the Veteran Sports Australia has already created a number of high profile relationships um, with sporting organisations in Australia, like Park, for instance, Park Run Australia. In terms of awareness for both sport, um, uh, and a, a support for veterans and adaptive sports. Um, Deloitte, my company, conducted a social impact assessment um, after the games. It found that 90% of those who witnessed the game said it gave, uh, gave them a, a higher, extremely high understanding of the challenges faced by um, wounded, injured and ill, the, the term we use in, a, in Australia. 84% um, of people who um, were involved with the games said it gave them an increased understanding of the challenges faced uh, by veterans. 71% said they now had an increased understanding and support for accessibility requirements across broader society, not just for, for veterans. Um, in terms of awareness and ongoing awareness, the New South Wales Department of Education developed and made available a nationally, um, uh, uh, made available a curriculum, uh, made it available nationally and online, um, aimed at year five to 12 students, focusing on, uh, uh, fo focusing on uh, service to the community and the importance of sport and resilience. In terms of tangible support announced, uh, I, I mentioned that the veteran scholarships already announced on the penultimate day of the games, the, the, the Prime Minister announced a, a veteran card and, and covenant, and we held a number of employment fairs and symposiums uh, during the week to promote, uh, to, to, to promote employment uh, opportunities for veterans. Uh, in terms of a more coherent ex-service organisation, we definitely created a, a, a platform for ex-service organisations or military charities to cooperate during, during the games. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult goal to measure um, and, and how successful we were in that, in, that endeavour is, is probably yet to be determined. I think uh, on one anecdotal count, we went from 3,000 3, ex-service organisations at the beginning of our journey to 5,000 at the end. So on that rather rough order, we, we may not have been too successful, successful there. Um, if I turn now to the lessons, 
um, of, of the games across the phase, you know, the, the things I would emphasise are the, the importance of planning legacy from an early stage um, and agreeing broadly with stakeholders what success looks like. For planning, it's about focusing and maintaining focus um, during, the, during the games uh, delivery period. It, you know, uh, organising committees are always stretched for resources, focused on delivering the competitor experience rightly so, and so maintaining a focus um, uh, on, on legacy initiatives is difficult. The other thing that I would say is really important is the importance of culturally onboarding staff. Um, in Sydney, we were blessed with the, the skill and acumen of uh, event professionals, but not all of whom really understood uh, the, what the Invictus Games was, was, was trying, trying to achieve. Um, and, and that became a tension that played out through, through the delivery of the games. Um, at games time, the biggest thing I would say is don't underestimate the ability to leverage goodwill and turn that into tangible activities. The outreach program that, that, that I mentioned before that resulted in all those tangible announcements was organised by one skilled volunteer within the organising committee and then the support of predominantly our partners. And post games, I would say the biggest thing is your, the importance of the organising committee maintaining focus uh, on the delivery outcomes. The news cycle moves quickly on. Um, announceables like that of the Prime Minister sort of uh, revert and disappear into, into bureaucracies uh, for, for delivery. Um, and so, that, so that's really a few thoughts from me from an organising committee's perspective on delivering a, a, a legacy uh, initiatives um, and outcomes. Um, look forward to answering further questions during the panel session. Uh, thank you, Ben, uh, and thank you, Blair. Uh, for, for those who struggled with the volume on the video uh, just now, we will share that with you after the event today, and we will also share the slide decks uh, if for those of you who struggled to read some of the smaller smaller font. Uh, I'm sure you agree, though, with two really good insights into the impact and legacy of the Invictus Games, and we're now going to arrange ourselves uh, for a panel session. We will have Blair and Ben and they will be joined by Dominic Reed, who's the Chief Executive of the Invictus Games Foundation, who you heard at the start of the day. Uh, so please, if you do have questions, please pop them either on the chat function, and don't forget to introduce yourself by telling us your name, your appointment and your nation, or on the Q&A function, both of which are at the bottom of your screen. We have had a few already, so I'm going to pick, uh, pick one, uh, ironically, from the, from the chat function for now, and it's from Bertrand in, in France. Uh, and uh, he made a comment, Blair, this is to you, Blair, where you were speaking. He said, I disagree with the speaker on the fact that the journey begins after the games. For our athletes in France, it is at the end of the experience. It is the end of the experience and the beginning of something else, a sort of achievement. Uh, and, and he goes on to say slightly later, it is because of how we consider the games in France, the final achievement and step of the reconstruction. Um, do you want to offer any comments to Bertrand on that? Absolutely. Maybe I, I can start, and then uh, and then Ben or Dominic can also uh, chime in with some of their their perspectives as well. Um, certainly, and that might have been even uh, uh, miscommunication on my part because that's certainly the work that Selena did um, to a great extent. That is certainly the message that she gained was especially for many of these individuals. Uh, Maintaining that connection with the games after the fact was a big part that the nations focused on was maintaining that connection as a mentor, as a coach through other things. And also keeping in mind that long, kind of long-term outcome. So, you know, kind of a little bit later in the, the presentation, you know, some of the, what the nations do is they have, they set aside specific times for discussions as a team where you include coaches, you include teammates. So it becomes almost like a norm to think about the next steps. And so that's certainly one of the big things um, that Selena pulled out was the, kind of that long-term focus where you think you set aside time to talk as a group about what, what does the future look like or what are you hoping to get out of these games, um, kind of along that step towards uh, kind of reconstruct, as Bertrand put it. Okay, Blair, uh, thank you. Dominic, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, 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 to some extent, I, I, I agree with Bertrand. I think it's a very interesting point that he brought up. I mean, certainly our experience back in 2014 was that I think the post, what we sort of referred to colloquially as the post-game slump, came as a 
as a bit of a surprise to us. And I think it was simply that we hadn't had the time and the and the focus really to plan beyond the games. We were so focused on producing something that that produced an effect, which it clearly did. But then after that, you know, a lot of people woke up the following day and and the games had finished and that that magic was over and 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 that was a difficult thing to deal with. I think that the, as a movement, we've moved on massively. And the fact that we've got, you know, nearly 300 people gathered here on this webinar today is, is, is absolutely sort of emblematic of that. And I think everybody has worked through the fact that it's a process. I always have likened the Invictus Games uh, to a beacon. I mean, it's something that draws people to it. And, and Bertrand's quite right, that if, if that is the pinnacle for somebody and they move to a post-Invictus world on the day after the games, as one or two people have notably done, uh, we, know, you know, we, know, we all know individuals who've done that, people also who've competed and then said, I've had my bit, I've got the benefit, I'm going to give a place on the team you know, to somebody else next year, I'm not going to reapply. That's absolutely what we want to be trying to achieve. But it, 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 it's, it is part of a process. We do need to be there to support people beyond it. We do try now to provide that, that sort of environment. And we do that um, at least in part through our notice board. So the We Are Invictus uh, in notice board. Anybody who has been involved can sign up to that. Anybody um, who is a bona fide uh, whiz can do that. And, and, and that is building a community and it's building that support and it's building those those things but clearly we, we we want to create as somebody said to me in sydney we want to create good civilians not not good veterans this is about moving beyond it's about using these opportunities to reconnect with family to reconnect with the community to rebuild a sense of purpose and i think you know so i, I don't think there's a right and a wrong but i think it's a really interesting issue and it's something that we all need to devote some time and thought to okay uh, thank you both let's uh, we'll move on to a different question um there's one from steve schwab on the question and answer uh, function uh, uh, and I'll pose this first to Ben on the back of you know you Ben you you touched on the role the IGF can play in supporting the legacy initiatives uh, and and uh, the role that the foundation might be able to play and Steve touches on uh, on this in his question he says I imagine that the cancellation of the games has been the hardest on the amazing competitors who had their hearts set on being in the Netherlands this week are there any virtual activities planned or underway to celebrate or honour the athletes in lieu of the actual games being held. It might be nice to do something like that. Uh, I'll offer it to, to, to Ben in the first instance uh, with his um, organising committee background and then maybe back to Dominic uh, after that. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we need to uh, think about uh, Connie and the team in, in The Hague. It, uh, it must be an incredible, well, it is an incredible disruption to, to, to postpone a, a year or so like that. But um, I'm sure, you know, they'll handle it well. I think in terms of the competitors, I think sort of Blair touched on it. Uh, much of this, is, you know, this is, so, for the competitors, so much of it is about the journey to the games and their preparations for the games, uh, rather than the actual games themselves. Um, and so I think, um, actually, this is an opportunity for them to, to extend their preparations. In terms of creating virtual uh, events, um, it's been touched on throughout, you know, the, the different things like this conference, but other events that are occurring. In the Sydney Games, one of the outreach programs that we did have was sort of incredible opportunities for people who are um, suffering from locked-in syndrome, who could in involve themselves in games, virtual games, you know, across, uh, across the globe, um, with absolutely no need to, to co-locate. Um, and so there are amazing opportunities for that. I think the other thing, I, uh, I would say, and, and this is to the point of you know, one of the reasons why we thought, thought it was really important to stand up Veteran Sports Australia as a legacy initiative um, in, of, of the Sydney Games was, yes, the Invictus Games are important, but they need to be, you know, to use Dominic's term, to be seen as part of a process, just one part of, of being involved in, a, in an active and a healthy life um, and being involved involved in sport and therefore sort of, you know, we, we used to speak about you know, the Invictus Games might be the inter international component of your participation but it's important that you know both before and after uh, you return return to sort of a, a club land world of where you do get that camaraderie on, on, a, on a local and a, and a, and a weekly basis um, and so I think anything you know uh, that the organizing committees the foundation can do to help support um, the development of a more coherent and ongoing uh, active veterans uh, sporting program um, is, is going to be a great thing. Thanks, Ben. Uh, any brief comments, Dominic? 
I think he's absolutely right. Um, but I think also, you know, what, what we're talking about here is sport as a mechanism to spur and to build recovery. Um, and, and so, you know, you, we're, we're not, we are, and, and we have created some high level professional athletes, but that's not the ambition of the Invictus Games. The ambition is to, is to make sport part of recovery. Um, and, and there will come a time uh, when, when you've done your sport and, and, and like me, you know, you, you're as, you're, you know, you're as good as you used to be kind of thing, but you, you know, you, you've moved on, you've done what you wanted to do, you've achieved and, and you found something, you found something new, hopefully. And that could be absolutely, it could be coaching. It could be, reconnection with your family it could be moving from participating in sport to commentating on sport it could be a whole variety of different things and and what we want to do is create that sort of that catalyst to to to, to change as many lives as possible and hopefully it it, it affects not just those people who are in the teams because we know that's just the tip of the pyramid it affects a broader a broader group of people as well and that's what we're we're here to do that's great Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Steve. Um, one more. We've got a question here from Alia, uh, who's the team manager of the Jordan team. Uh, and I'll put this to you, Blair, uh, first. So I wanted to ask about the potential rehab and mental health programs for Invictus Games competitors post-participation, so that beyond the medals and the recognition, there is a sense of continuity and sustainability for those who have participated to ensure, amongst other issues, that they remain connected to the Invictus community beyond the actual Games benefiting from the relationships and resources, et cetera, of the Invictus Games family. Is there anything in your research, um, uh, Blair, that would, uh, help, would, would help in that? Yeah, a few, a few pieces. So there, there are certainly a couple um, touched on during the, the talk to some extent where, you know, nations, you know, one of the, there are several nations who did make efforts to refer out to different sport organizations that might already be in the communities uh, already like uh, existing sport organizations for either non-competitors or, or just to, to provide opportunities that way. That, that is a lot, of, um, a lot of resources. It's demanding to do so, but um, some of the nations and some of the non-competitors felt like that showed that, that, their, um, that some of their coaches um, and other individuals did care about them and their opportunities to be involved in sports. So I think that's one sustainable pathway um, if you think about it in that terms, uh, that, that was uncovered. Um, so I think that's a big piece. Um, another piece, and I believe we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about some of this maybe in the sessions later on, is also uh, a part around integrating the family. Um, so families are a big, important part of this. And so when athletes have been talked about, have talked in interviews about what helped them experience some of the, you know, the most complete physical, social, and psychological benefits, you know, after the games, to some extent, it was all, also the integration of people like spouses, partners, other family members um, who experience the games can be part of that journey uh, and pathway. And certainly that, that I think that's another big, um, big component of this, um, certainly trying to make it find ways to have that sustainable impact um, over the long haul. So those are a couple of approaches um, that I could think of. Great, thank you. We'll go to one more. I think hopefully, probably time for one more question, maybe two, depending on how long the answers are, I guess. Um, so there's one who was sort of links to the previous one, and I'm going to pose this to Ben in the first um, first instance. Um, and now I've said that, I've now lost it on the screen. Where are we? I've just scrolled past it. Uh, there we go, got it. From Beth Knox. Uh, Other than just attending the competition, what examples of how spectators engage with the games and the competitors? to help increase awareness, inclusiveness, and support of our veterans following the event. Uh, ben. Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, one of those key success factors we, we identified early on was that the participants had a, a positive experience. And, and I think that social impact study that we conducted definitely supported that. Uh, for Sydney Games, for example, we had 110,000 people um, visit the park during, during, the, during the course of the course of the week, all of which you know, that 90% figure that, that I quoted before came away with an increase, you know, stating they had an increased understanding of, of wounded Indian and ill um, journey, their challenges that they face, and therefore sort of some broader understanding of some sort of societal challenges relating to um, accessibility and, and adaptive sport. I, so, you know, I, and, and that, I, I, I really think it's one of the advantages that the Invictus Games has is you have relatable heroes in terms of the 
competitors. Um, it's not an elite sporting environment uh, where you can't access the, 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 the competitors. Uh, the ability to, to mingle um, around the sporting field with competitors engage, and, and you know the really nice feeling that's brought to the competitors with the through the family and friend program and that sort of interaction. That's that's really what helps to drive that 90% figure of, of increased understanding. Then thanks. Uh, Dominic, any comments on the back of that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, I think there are a couple of things to really say. One, one is that the, the work that Selena and, and her team have done and have done brilliantly was to, to try and create a data set that underpinned the anecdote that we all had pretty much uh, instantly around 2014, but needed to be sort of backed up with, with fact and with science, which was that this was having a profound, the, the, the participation, the pre preparation, the getting there, the medal winning, the whole experience was having a profound effect beneficial effect on, on participants and families alike. And I think that's important. And I think there are opportunities now in this COVID environment we find ourselves in for people to get involved with online activity, to, to connect through our website with the, with the I Am app um, and to involve themselves in virtual activity as well. Um, but I do think it's, it, it, it is, I genuinely think this is part of a process. So it's, it's about community and it's about process. Get involved, join up with people, do it online, you know, join a ride, join a competition, you know, row against your mates. It can be done in a relatively low tech way. It can be done, you know, it can be done in a glamorous high tech way. We will endeavor to build more opportunity in the future, obviously. Um, but it's a question of that sort of sense of belonging. And I think this, this grouping um, online has been a good start for that because actually, you know, we're all kind of finding our way with the technology, but we're all actually beginning to join up. That's great. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question, provided the answer is relatively short. I'll give it to Ben. So Nick Booth, it's reference to social impact assessment. How far ahead of the games was it designed and how far into the future will it be repeated and maintained? So we, we started our sort of concept and bid phase in, in 2016. So um, you know, a good, um, a good two years before the games um, uh, is, is you know, two and a half years is when we we settled on on what we wanted our legacy initiatives to become, um, uh, 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 or our legacy outcomes to become, uh, and really then we had to be opportunistic through the delivery cycle about how we how we got after what those leg legacy outcomes would be. Um, yeah, it's it's incredibly easy to lose focus as you focus in on the on on the crown jewels of delivering the games, um, but that early planning of what you want the delivery outcomes to be, uh, the legacy outcomes to be is really important. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to draw a line under the first panel as we've reached time. Uh, I'll, thank you very much to all the speakers, uh, to Blair and to Ben. Uh, for your presentations uh, and to you, you all three of you for giving such candid answers and of course actually to the uh, to the audience for asking some great questions. We're now going to take a 10 minute break uh, so there's a chance now for you to stretch your legs, grab a tea, a coffee or a beer or whatever you want I guess uh, and we'll start again at 15.25 hours sharp, uh, that's UK time, 25 past three when we hear from three more great speakers on the topic of resilience. I'll see you in a few minutes. Please be back ready to start at 25 past three. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It's now time to shift focus onto the topic of resilience. And really, has there been a more appropriate time with the global pandemic affecting all of us? I think before we go down that rather serious route, I just reference the polling results. So in answer to hand on heart, are you wearing PJs right now? Um, a total of 57% of people clearly told a mistruth and said that they never wear pyjamas right now. Uh, and only 18% uh, were being reasonably honest with yes. 19% said business on top, PJs on the bottom. And uh, a very honest 7% said I literally took them off a minute ago. So it's good to see that you're playing an active part in our polling results, uh, polling uh, sessions, uh, and uh, starting to generate some of the sense of community that is so special about the Invictus Games. Uh, we now have three more great speakers who I'll make brief introductions to in a moment. Again, there will be a panel session at the end where they will take further questions. So uh, please put any questions you have on the question and answer function uh, or any thoughts you have on the chat function at the bottom of your screens. 
And don't forget, please, to introduce yourselves when you do with your name, your appointment, and your nation. And that makes it easier for us to pose the questions and understand the context too. Uh, now I will introduce uh, Dr. Molly Marty, who is the founder and chief executive officer of the National Resilience Institute of the United States of America. And she's also the chief executive officer of Worldmaker International. Molly is both an attorney and a social psychologist and trains and consults internationally to help pioneer the fields of trauma recovery, workplace mental health, veteran support, and school-based resilience. She is speaking to us today on the value and importance of resilience in the 21st century. Welcome, Molly. We are all looking forward enormously to hear what you have to say. Uh, the screen is now yours. Thank you, David. And while I pull up my slides, I would like to just say um, how grateful I am to be here to talk about resilience today. Um, there we go. So our working definition of human resilience, we crafted this alongside our research partners, veteran affairs and education and crisis response, is that it's the capacity to prepare for, adapt to, and grow through adversity. And that word capacity is really important because resilience is not something you either have or don't have, but it um, can be grown and cultivated. And um, we need to do the work to reap the benefits, but that work might look a bit different than what you would expect. I'm gonna be curious about our conversation. Um, in many ways, I think I'm going to give, to give shape and a structure to what you're already living with the Invictus Games. Um, this is the Thrive Resilience model. This re research began about 10 years ago after our community lost three teens to suicide and we had more kids going to the hospital. And we asked the question that um, I, I, we've seen communities and individuals ask again and again, you know, what does a community or an organization look like that creates these multiple layers of safety nets so that no life falls through and all can be supported to thrive. And the research shows these are six essential capacity builders. The first, uh, the research shows is actually the most important one, uh, trusted adults. We need to be in relationship with people that we trust, who encourage and support us and are positive role models for us. We need high expectations um, to be held uh, accountable without shame and to be supported to meet the stretch goals that we have set for us. And then we set ourselves, of course. Um, we need resilient skills. There are ways that we can refuel positive energy, that we um, grow our strengths, we regulate our emotions, we have coping skills, um, we develop our social networks and relationships. We need to be involved. Uh, humans are, are social beings, we're tribal beings, and we need ways to contribute in meaningful ways. Uh, to our community. We also thrive when we have vision, that we have hope for a more positive future and that we are actively co-creating toward that future. And then finally, um, we need enrichment, that we on a whole person um, approach are supported to actively grow and um, share our, our strengths. So it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. The Thrive model, the graphics, the supports are available on our website, which I will share later in the presentation. What I wanted to do today is talk about these storylines um, that you can be thinking about and, and grappling with um, between now and when we gather in person next year. And the first is that resilience is about understanding and meeting basic human needs. All behavior communicates a need. And we simplify these needs, uh, very similar to what Dr. Evans was talking about. Um, we kind of group them. Um, and these are the four uh, basic needs that we all share. The first is that we have a need to feel safe, uh, physically and psychologically safe. And we take a trauma-informed approach. So um, you might not see that in all models, but it really is a, a starting place to meet our human needs. The second is we have a need to belong. Like I said, we're social uh, beings and we need to be uh, feel like we're seen and heard and accepted, uh, part of that tribe. We have a need uh, for purpose to make these meaningful contributions to our tribe. 
and we have a need for competence. Uh, this is what Dr. Evans was talking about with um, mastery and autonomy. They all kind of come together, um, self-efficacy in this concept of competence, that we have a need to um, have the resources and achieve our objectives, to feel we have choices about important aspects of our life, and to feel that others see us as being good at something. So I want to flip side this because I think it really is helpful to see that when we don't feel safe, we feel threatened. And when we don't have that purpose, we feel useless. When we don't belong, we feel isolated. And we lack that competence, we feel powerless. And when we are feeling threatened and useless and isolated and powerless, it will erode resilience and well-being. I want to share a tactic. I'm spending a little more time on this first storyline. I'm going to share three storylines today. Um, but here's a tactic that you can practice. Um, and it's focusing on responding to the need being exhibited versus reacting to the behavior. And we all tended to react to that behavior because it drives us crazy. We're like, why are you doing this? I've told you it drives me crazy. It's crazy. I've told you it's not okay. It's not appropriate. And when we can shift to what need is being expressed with curiosity, with an open mind and open heart, and think, I wonder what happened to you? What is your story? You know, what need is being expressed? And we have found in our research that a really uh, helpful go-to question is this one on the bottom. You know, what can I do right now to improve this relationship? Because when we focus on moving into relationship, this is where we have the opportunities for connection, for repair, for growth, um, for healing, and for resilience and thriving. The second storyline that I want to submit is that human resilience is about mattering and caring. There is actually a whole science of mattering, something that sounds soft, but we need to know that other people care about this, that, that our life has significance. And we also um, need to learn how to really own that and use that to fuel a prioritization on our own self-care. Off to the right, our, uh, when we teach the resilience piece of the Thrive Model, the resilient skills, we have a, a framework called the Thrive Five. And on the right, you'll see uh, self-care and self-awareness. Those are the first couple pieces of that Thrive Five. Um, but the takeaway that here is the first pulse to check is your own. Um, no matter what your role, no matter what your job, if you can start to prioritize my job, <laughs> whether I'm a, you know, a, a teacher or a veteran support service personnel or a, a speaker or an educator, whatever your job is, I'm a parent, uh, my number one job in this moment is to keep my heart rate at 60 beats per minute or whatever your baseline is. That's my job, because if I check my pulse first and I stay regulated, then through mirror neurons, through modeling, through that ability to connect, we're able to be more effective in helping other people, more effective in, in being their hope builders or their resilience builders, right? So check your own pulse first and prioritize that self-care. The third storyline is that resilience is going beyond grit. And I know uh, with our warriors, um, I'm an American with Americans, right? We love grit. We love to think that I am thriving because I am, um, I have this virtue, I have this talent, or I have this ability to suck it up and, and push through and pull myself up by the bootstraps. And, and yes, this, um, these individual factors are important. I came to this work. Um, after a, more than a decade as a performance psychologist. So I worked with elite um, athletes up to Olympic and world levels and worked with corporates. And I love mindset and I, I love those individual factors. But I am reformed in many ways because once we lost those lives and we worked more in the area of suicide prevention and, and response and postvention, as well as just uh, human resilience and, and understanding the impact of trauma, I uh, see the full scale of human resilience and the science of resilience shows this, that resilience is more about being resourced. It's more about those relationships than being resourceful. Uh, a great quote here by Michael Unger, a, a researcher in Canada, right? This, this grit makes great television. 
um, but those resources uh, is what the science shows. And so it's really important that we take our perspective uh, beyond grit. So we all will have opportunities in our life as part of the human experience where we're going to be welcome to the club. And this is a club we don't want to be a part of. We didn't ask for it. We weren't looking for it. And for many of us, we've had uh, these experiences that we wouldn't wish on our worst enemy. And yet, here they are. They become part of our life. And uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, the speed of life, the nature of the 21st century, these experiences are becoming more common. Um, hello, global pandemic. <laughs> so they're coming to us and our um, response is to become more resilient. And that uh, using those capacities like the Thrive Model. It also helps to be looking at the stories we're writing. You know, are you grappling with being welcome to a club in this sort of way where it feels like an ending? And, and how can you work and shift so maybe it's more of a messy middle and you can grapple with that and write a new ending? Or are you in a club where you feel like, that's my whole life story. If I were to write a book, that would be the name of it. And you can shift and continue to develop that story. So it becomes perhaps a chapter in your life story or maybe a paragraph in a chapter in your life story. These photos are from uh, a recent club I was welcomed into. Uh, I am from an amazing family, uh, and it's in a family that has a genetic predisposition for uh, five different types of cancer. And um, some have fared better than others. My brother, when he was 17, became a, a survivor of brain cancer. My three-year-old niece died from it. My uh, mother, we lost my mother early to breast cancer, I was 22 and she died. Um, my sister became a survivor in her early 50s and her 34 year old daughter is a, a new survivor. A couple of years ago, um, even though we have these genetics, I didn't think that I was gonna join that club and just a routine uh, doctor's appointment turned into uh, a discovery that I had three malignant tumors that I needed some pretty extensive surgery and recovery to come through it. And at that time, I was a crossfitter. I don't think I probably need to share with this crowd. Uh, I think a lot of you are uh, advocates and, and active crossfitters. Um, but I loved CrossFit. And um, one of my favorite days was uh, the Murph Memorial Day here in the States, where we honor Michael Murphy and all of the fallen servicemen and women. And I couldn't do that the first year of my surgery. But what I could do is I could do a breast cancer awareness walk with my uh, survivor sisters and others. And so that's the top picture. And then that next year I set that goal um, and I was resourced enough and I had those relationships and support and use those elements the model to be able to compete again in the MERV. And this bottom picture is a, a friend of mine who finished well ahead of me and circled back and ran me in on that last mile. So, that's a, a bit of story writing, and I think that we're, um, you know, you're here in your writing stories, and Invictus Games is an extraordinary partner in helping all of us write um, stories of resilience and to support each other in that. We at Worldmaker are here. Um, this is our storyline, you know, that we need each other to survive and that we thrive together. So if you go to our websites at worldmakerinternational.org, or um, which is our, our global work that we've been doing a couple of years with the National Resilience Institute, which is the work we've been doing in the States for the last decade, <clears throat> you will find some resources. Um, as Brene Brown uh, has this quote here from her grandmother's wisdom, you know, we don't need to do it all alone. We were never meant to. And I want to finish up by, by sharing where the name World Maker came from. Um, World Maker actually comes from the research on the paths of veterans when they move and transition from active service to civilian life. They're tasked with creating new meaning and new connections and that, that sense of competence. And, and so we love that word world maker and we also um, embrace its broader collective meaning. We as humanity are being tasked with uh, creating a world worthy of our children and future generations. And so um, it's wonderful to connect with you today. I'm very much looking forward to the, the sunnier day in the future uh, when we can be together in person at The Hague. Thank you. Molly, uh, thank you very much for such a
great start to session three. Uh, for, for the audience, I just remind you about uh, putting your comments and your thoughts back into the on the comments uh, button that you've got on your screen, and also any questions on the question and answer button, which is also at the foot of your screen. Uh, and we'll pick them up as we go along. Uh, we're now going to hear from Tish Stropes. Uh, Tish is the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at the Fisher House Foundation, and she's responsible for Fisher House's involvement and sponsorship of the Invictus Games. Additionally, she oversees the HERO program, which helps families connect during, to keep families connected during the healing process. And finally, her portfolio also includes developing, sustaining the long-term partnerships with organizations that support the mission and vision of Fisher House. Tish was also an Air Force spouse and has experienced at first hand the highs and lows of military life. Tish, it's great you can be with us. We look forward to hearing you speak on the experience, contribution and aspirations of family and friends within the WIS community. Uh, the screen is now yours. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Thank you, David, for that introduction. Um, I wanna welcome everybody to my home here in Arlington, Virginia. So settle in and stay in as long as you'd like. Um, you've heard some great research from my colleagues but I wanna speak about the lived experience. The experience, the contributions and aspirations of family and friends within the wounded, injured and ill community is really unlike any other. Families, families living life, add to that for many moving around, new schools, friends, deployments, you know, the daily ins and outs. And then one day life happens in an unexpected way. Um, something completely unimaginable happens that sets our families on a course that truly is like no other. The experience of waking up to the unimaginable because it was never supposed to happen to you. Now, I want you to think about for a second, think back to when you were a child, maybe five years old and you were sick and you didn't feel well. What did you do? You probably cried out to your mom or your dad and you went and found them, crawled up into their lap and snuggled in because you knew that if you could just be in their arms and feel that love, that somehow things would be better. Well, here we are for many of us 30 years plus later, and still those same feelings lie within us. At Fisher House, we believe a family's love is good medicine. And that, that my Invictus Games family will always be true. At Fisher House, we build comfort homes next to the military and veteran hospitals so that when a loved one is in the hospital, their family can be right by their side. So imagine a home away from home, the closest thing to your home, really. We support not just the service member or veteran, but rather the entire family. You see, a family serves together. And as such, we ensure that the entire family is taken care of. We try and remove as many burdens as possible and ensure that the only thing a family needs to focus on is their loved one. And no, it's not an easy road, but we recognize the importance of having family there when you need it the most. So in essence, we bridge that gap between the military, what they can do and what they cannot do. And we focus on taking care of those basic needs, the things that you forget during a crisis, like where am I gonna sleep tonight? Or what am I gonna eat? We try and remove all the burdens we can so that the only thing a family needs to really worry about is their loved one's healing. And the families within the Fisher House become family to one another. They take care of each other. They build a community that lasts forever. And their contributions to one another are life-changing. And then one day, each family on their own schedule departs. It's a bittersweet. Yet it's exactly the goal of each family to go home with their loved one and to move on with their new normal. We help our service members and veterans by taking care of their families. Over the last 30 years, we've built 86 Fisher houses and helped somewhere in the range of 368,000 families, but it doesn't end there. The journeys and aspirations continue. And while that initial battle was won, the road that follows can be just as difficult. So 10 years ago, we fought to create a family program at Warrior Games to ensure that community support would still be there. And as I observed our families in action, 
supporting their loved ones and interacting, I realized that no matter where these families came from, it didn't matter if they were officers or enlisted, if they had big families or small ones, regardless of their service branch, they all shared the same basic desire of staying together as a family. They all wanted to help their loved ones get better. They all had the same needs to be loved and supported when they were most vulnerable, most in need. So based on the principle of keeping it simple, we continued the model of Fisher House by providing programming for those family members, members supporting their loved ones. These loved ones are the men and women who have already sacrificed so much. Those wounded warriors looking to move forward, to heal and to continue on their journey, not alone, but with their families. You see, that's the key here, healing together as a family, not on separate tracks, not on two parallels, not alone, but together. And so in the end, what do you get? What are the aspirations? Families that feel loved and taken care of, families that can really focus on cheering their loved ones on, the journey's been very long for many families, and finally, they can celebrate the accomplishments and see things in many cases in a clearer light. I want to give you an example or share an example with you of an impact we had on a family during the third year at Warrior Games. Um, we were at the family registration when one of the Marine Corps dads came in, a big burly man, and he was registering. And he looked at me and said, this whole event is just a waste of time. Well. I had no idea why he even thought that. He had just gotten there, had no idea what it was gonna be about. But clearly his journey was nowhere near over. And in fact, he seemed kind of lost. And so the father told me about his son. All he ever did every day was go out and ride a bike. And that was his passion and he loved it. But what the dad really felt, what his son should be doing was going and finding a job and getting on with his life. He just needed to grow up after all. And so not knowing what to really say to this father, I smiled and I told him I hope he would enjoy the week and find something good in it. Well, the next day happened to be cycling competition. And as I was standing on the fence line, I realized that the father, the same father I had met the previous day, was standing on that fence line as well. And he was looking carefully and intently at all the cyclists searching for his son. And all of a sudden he kind of stretched his arm out and he pointed and he said, there's my son, that's him. And as he looked and, and his son came around the bend, you saw their faces meet. And that son's smile just lit up. He saw his father. And all of a sudden that Marine Corps dad had this audible pause of, <gasps> and I heard him say, that, that's my son, that's my little boy. And so I told him to run to the finish line so he could be there when his son got there and, and went on with the day. Well, several days later, I was in the hotel lobby and that same father walked up and caught my glance. And he looked over at me and said, hey, I owe you an apology. He said, I never wanted to be here. I told you this was a waste of my time. But while my son rode his bike yesterday for the first time, in two years, I finally saw my little boy again, that smile. And now I know when I go home, I know why he rides his bike and I know that I'm gonna ride my bike with him. We can finally be a family again. And that was something I had lost. And that, that is the power of the family program, to have your loved one by your side, making that journey, that journey of recovery together. This basic model of taking care of the friends and families, of providing lodging, meals, programming, and more has grown beyond those days years ago in the Warrior Games and now serves as that same model at the Invictus Games. And while each organizing committee every couple of years puts on their own flavor and spin, at the core of those family programs are all the same. They're simple programming. I think the most important question that we need to ask ourselves, are these programs meeting the basic needs of the family? If a family's basic needs are not being supported and met, then how can we expect them to grow and to heal and to continue on that path? By creating family programs, 
by integrating our families into the continued healing process. Families feel loved and supported when they are most vulnerable, overwhelmed, and in need. Our wounded, injured, and ill are looking to move forward, to feel, and to continue on their journeys with their families. The family program we create, the, the family programs that we create make this very simple. It's simple programming. It's big impact. Because a family's love is good medicine. Thanks, David. Trish, thank you. Uh very much for offering really great insights into the vital role of military families and their own needs and aspirations during difficult times. Of course, these are the people who are closest to us and they ride the roller coaster of recovery with us uh, as we set off on that journey. Uh, there are stabilizers, but they have their own needs and their own aspirations. And that was wonderfully put. It was interesting, I think, also that the poll result, which was asking what is the first thing you're going to do after lockdown, saw. See your family and friends as the as the as the long way leader in terms of people's responses, and that rather plays to the same theme that you've just given us. So thank you very much. Um, we're now going to hear from our final speaker, Matthew Amadon. Matthew is the director of the Military Service Initiative at the George W. Bush Presidential Center, where he leads the day-to-day -day efforts of the Military Service Initiative and the team leading their policy and program work on veteran transition. Recently, Matthew was also appointed by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to the Creating Options for Veterans Expedited Recovery Commission, uh, known as COVER. Bit of a mouthful, but these things never are short titles. COVER provides advice to the Veterans Administration, the President, and Congress. Matthew, in his spare time, what little there is of it, is also a colonel in the US Marine Corps Reserve, where he is the Deputy Group Commander of Marine Aircraft Group 41. Matthew, welcome uh, to the panel. We're really looking forward to listening to you talking about fostering a life worth living. Uh, the screen is now yours. Thank you, David. And just want to make sure everybody can hear me and see the screen. But um, before I begin and say, much like Tish, good morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, Mr. Flatten, I was very taken with your comment of resilient families spawn resilient warriors. And uh, with that, I think that's so embedded in everything that we do. Um, again, thanks to Dominic and the Invictus Games team for, um, for providing this opportunity uh, in between the games. Uh, Molly and Tish, your amazing presentations. To deliver the power of resilience as a community and the great work being done by Fisher House with its focus on family. Uh, is truly a game changer. And again, to the Invictus leadership, uh, today is so crucial and thank you as we seek to join in community, not only during milestone events like the games, but in the important in-between where and when we can leverage and share best practices and playbooks. We fight together, recover together, and lead together. Uh, with that, on behalf of the Military Service Initiative at the Bush Institute, I'm just honored and humbled to share of our experience, program design, and ongoing supportive research to help illuminate and validate the power of the community of sport and the power of peer. Every day we work to ensure post 9-11 veterans and their families make successful transitions to civilian life with a focus on optimizing health and well-being and leveraging meaningful educational and career pathways. This is all so they can maximize their resilience and continue to be the leaders our nations will forever need. Dominic, to your point, making good civilians. That is the why that drives what we do and our Team 43 family built over many years through our Warrior Open Golf Tournament and Warrior 100K Mountain Bike Ride has been life-changing for many as they now have a collaborative community to share challenges, opportunities, and to simply support one another. For eight years, we have seen those in need and their families interact with one another during the events that became lasting relationships, to Bertrand's comment of the journey. See this revealed in the portraits, 98 paintings done by President Bush and the portraits of courage. Uh, it was a testament of tribute to America's warriors. Specifically, Chris Turner, a still serving army officer, twice painted by President Bush and the only one painted twice. This is a visual testament to the before after and the family that is Team 43. Chris first joined us 
in 2015 and had never publicly shared his story or his battle with the invisible wounds reflected in the darker painting to the left. But during that open, amongst the family and President Bush, for the first time ever, he opened up about his sacrifice, struggles, and recovery. He now says he has the ability to openly communicate without fear or stigma and looks for opportunities to share his story and encourage those afraid of seeking help, paying it forward. He often returns to our warrior events to share of the power of the community of sport and like Invictus that our events are so much more than a day on the calendar. See the second portrait to the right reflecting a brighter today where Chris embraces his role as leader and messenger to those who may follow. Relationships, friendships, and the networks that support them has for us revealed the incredible value in leveraging a more mature structured support system, inclusive then of peer-based organizations so integral to the effort. Therefore, our, our foundational work focuses on the barriers to that care that include individual concerns, the often confusing pathways to navigate, and the need to find care that is effective. Some concerning statistics that influenced us is less than half of military personnel and veterans who experience the invisible wounds actually receive any care. This is in direct contrast with the estimated 83% of warriors who receive care for a visible wound of war. In addition, we all know that the system of care for us is fragmented and confusing for the customer in many ways. And while the large majority of our veterans receive care in our communities, only 13% of community mental health providers are ready to deliver culturally competent evidence-based care to veterans confronting the invisible wounds. That's why the path we have chosen to address the invisible wounds, specifically post-traumatic stress and TBI, embraces the deliberate and functional interaction of high quality care providers and some of the more popular and relevant networks in the U.S. today. Our Warrior Wellness Alliance is laser focused on one, enhancing accurate awareness and understanding of the invisible wounds and their impacts, two, increasing the number of warriors who are seeking and accessing high quality care, and three, improving the delivery of that care across the system. So within this unique design is not only the resource of high quality care, but the preconditions to increase the desire to seek care fostered by our peer networks to the left there. But there are key elements of this design and, and today, what can we share across the Invictus international landscape? Well, there's a deliberate connection resource and that's the red arrow in between the two blue boxes. This is a specific person who is at the other end of a dedicated phone number email and app where initial triage into lanes of care is determined by a qualified individual. This offers the efficient path for those in need to get connected with the right care at the right place and the right time and reduces the burden on the user. We're piloting this in three locations and we look forward to sharing the lessons learned. But we have to know our customer and in support of this, our peer networks should attempt to capture some commonality of data. Within our common data elements paper and framework, this resource recommended 15 common data elements relevant to wellness designed to be adopted by our peer partners with the least amount of burden. This paper is now available for anyone interested. And to the upper right, this is not just awareness. Through targeted outreach and communications, we are asking organizations with a very demanding core mission to enact behavioral change while engaging in their day-to-day -day mission. A necessary lane to be successful in this outreach is by identifying within each peer organization that change agent, or in our terminology, the super peer, who has safe and effective resources can influence those in need to take the first step, peers helping peers. However, how do we know what right looks like? We have to conduct that research to support our program design that includes a look into high quality care and with our partners at RAND, we're formalizing a definition and framework of what it means to deliver high quality care for the invisible wounds, which is veteran-centered, evidence-based, and measurement-based. This is important so that we know across the Alliance what we're doing is safe and effective, so that when we grow the Alliance through increased membership, we have a foundational system to build from and clear expectations and standards. We look forward to sharing this report with all of you when released later this year, as we plan to share the definition with the broader clinical community. But as importantly, we also plan to draft a consumer tool for veterans to use when seeking care. But is our design process safe and effective? And with our partners at Syracuse, we are assessing whether our previously defined connection resource is safe and effective. It has to meet those in need where they are, and it has to refer them to care in an efficient way. 
but it also has to be measurable. And I mentioned Team 43. And like was mentioned so many, time, or so many times earlier, there's just great power in the community of sport. We are examining the specifics of what makes Team 43 special and effective as a supportive network beyond sporting events. All of this to foster increased resilience, establish systems of support to those in need in order to foster a life worth living to the benefit of our warriors, their families, our communities, and nations. And with that, and with this as a beginning to our collective efforts, we just look forward to keeping in touch. And although I think, you know, the games were canceled this year, within this lies opportunity as we eagerly await 2021 and the chance to see one another again. Again, we fought together, we will recover together, and we will continue to lead together. To the Invictus team, thank you for the opportunity today, and we look forward to seeing everybody in 2021. Matthew, thank you. And that was a great way to conclude uh, the third session. Uh, we're now going to call up our panel, which will be comprised of Molly, uh, Tish, Matthew, and Dominic Reed again, and they will be joined by three other guests. First will be Mr. Stuart Sharman. Stuart is a former Royal Signals Officer in the British Army with 30 years service, and is now Deputy Managing Director of the FDM Group in the United Kingdom, and the Global Head of FDM's X-Forces Initiative. In that role, Stuart has overseen setting up and running the X-Forces Initiative since, 20, uh, since January 2014. The programme has recruited, trained and placed over 563 ex-service personnel of all ranks as FDM consultants across the FDM client base and is now looking to establish ex-forces programmes across the USA, Australia and Canada. So he is in a good place to take questions on employment and the employer's perspective. The second is Professor Eric Vermetten. Eric is Strategic Advisor of Research to the Military Mental Health Service with the Dutch Ministry of Defence. He holds an endowed chair in psychiatry at the Department of Psychiatry at Leiden University Medical Centre. He is also a professor at ARQ National Psychotrauma Research Group in the Netherlands and holds an adjunct professorship at the Department of Psychiatry of New York University Medical Centre. He trained in the Netherlands as well as in the USA in psychiatry and neuroscience, and he has over 20 years ex expertise working with military personnel and veterans with PTSD. And third is Professor Air Commodore Rich Withnell, who is Head of Research and Clinical Innovation for the UK Defence Medical Services. Rich is a general practitioner and was the first primary care clinician to be appointed as the Minister of Defence's Medical Director. And frankly, he holds too many other appointments for me to list here. Uh, I remind you that, uh, welcome all of the panelists. I'd remind you all in the audience that if you have a question, please use either the chat function or the Q&A function, preferably the Q&A function, at the bottom of your screens and introduce yourself, give me your name, appointment and nation. So a big welcome to the panel members. Uh, we have a few questions already uh, and I'll, uh, I'll pick one of the first questions now once I clear my screen and some of the stuff is there for now. I'll start with uh, Rich Wisnell, who has, has joined us. Rich chairs the Warrior Care in the 21st Century Programme. Rich, could you tell us a little bit about what this is and what you have achieved so far. David, of course, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, lovely to join you from the UK. Um, Warrior Care in the 21st century uh, started in 2014 after the Recovery Summit in London. Uh, I'm very privileged to chair it, and I may pay tribute, if I may, to Brett Stevens, my US co-chair until last year. We're a, a multinational, multi-specialty, multidisciplinary collaboration. We've had representatives from over 40 nations contribute to our work. And uniquely, we consider medical and non-medical issues around three key themes. A resilience work strand, which is led by colleagues from Australia. A recovery and rehabilitation work strand led by colleagues in the UK. And a reintegration work strand, be that into military service or into civilian life, uh, led by our colleagues in Georgia. So we involve service people, be they in uniform, be they civilian or be they contractors, military veterans, their families, the military chain of command and the charitable sector all in one place. We've had really successful symposia after London in Orlando, in Toronto in 2017, in Sydney in 2018. And thanks to uh, Professor Eric, who you've just introduced, there was going to be a fantastic programme in The Hague at the moment, but we look forward to doing that uh, on another occasion. 
Uh, David, we've been close to the Invictus Games uh, since the beginning, but delighted and, and very grateful to Richard Smith that we're now building a more formal collaboration with the Invictus Games Foundation to carry on this work in partnership with you. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, back to you, David. Uh, thank you. That was really clear. We'll take first, the next question is from Alexandra, uh, which uh, she I'm going to pose to Molly. Um, Alexandra, Alexandra asks, although much of the uh, much of resilience literature focuses on the individual and on developing individual resilience skills, however, resilience exists in the context of relationships and specifically of supportive and uh, supportive and mentoring relationships. That's why terms like tribe hold so much power for those of us who have served. Do you want to comment on that, Molly? Social beings, tribal beings, we need each other in so many ways. Um, I remember that moment, uh, like I said, I, I came to this work really focused on individual resilience. And I knew um, I was teaching at the University of Iowa when we lost the, the children and I started this uh, nonprofit work and I knew we needed to learn and I, we needed to teach. And so we looked around the world at where we could learn the most, the most quickly and we settled on the Israel Trauma Coalition, a nonprofit, um, non-political, a political group that had been doing this work. And we are in the south of Israel where there's a very short period of time between um, when a code red goes off and when they need to get under bomb shelters or they could lose their lives. And we heard stories of losing children and losing lives. And, and we spent that day also in the community resiliency centers. And I thought, you know, just that the people know that there's a code red and they have to get to shelter or they have, you know, those logistics, that's survival. But what I'm seeing going on here in this community, that even within that type of challenge and adversity, people can still find ways to connect and have meaning and have purpose and have hope, like that's resilient. And, and that was really my entry point into wanting to do that deep dive into the research and, and, and put this work together and continue the work that we're doing. Um, but yeah, we, we need a tribe. We are part of a tribe. And um, and, and again, Invictus Games knows this, right? They're doing so much right because they're meeting those needs for, for belonging and connection and, and purpose. Um, but absolutely. Thank you. Matthew, would you like to offer any thoughts? Um, I just wanted to say in terms of the, the power of resilience, um, it was mentioned earlier that I think, Dominic, you had mentioned the, um, I guess, the post-event letdown or the post-event hangover. And the one way that we're seeking to kind of mitigate that or, or solve for it is that when, before the event is led into, and, and to your point, Molly, of we need each other and, and we're sort of tribal, it's as important for us to deliver an event, um, but it's ever more important to welcome them into a family and a community. And it, it feels like that can help mitigate the after event effects, sort of the letdown, because it's more important of what you do in between. And for us, it's just become, it's not the size of your network, it's what you do with it. And um, we admittedly have a very small community of 184 warriors and their families who are part of that small network, uh, but actively engaged on the technology platform that we've um, provided for them. So at least you can allow for the mechanisms of the network and that tribal resilience that you spoke so well of, Mark, uh, Molly. So um, that's what we would say to that, David. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, there's a question here for Tish, actually, I think, from Sarah Robinson. Uh, Sarah has asked, um, a family's love is the best medicine. How do we ensure that we get as many of the families involved as we can? On a personal level, I have struggled to involve my family in my illness, and some of them just don't get it. And I know I'm not alone in this. Um, could you just offer Tish some of your some of your perspective on the challenges of involving the family in that way? Absolutely, thank you. And and Sarah, what I would say is um, first of all that you know family. It is it's not just the the family you were born into and and those blood members, um, but it's rather also your friends, the ones that you, that you surround yourself with. And so within the Invictus Games family, I can tell you that every single competitor, every single family that is there is your family and your friend. And, and sometimes it might be too close for our family members um, and they're on their journey too. And, and they may not understand what you're going to figure it out themselves, but 
to be able to bring in your other family members, um, other friends, and, and eventually, hopefully, that family will be a part of it, but know that you're not alone. Um, I, I, I know that everybody probably sitting here, over two, 300 participants are feeling the same way that um, as much as we all want our family members to be close and, and part of that recovery, it takes time. Um, so continue exposing them, continue involving them. And what I would say to every competitor, bring your family members, bring your friends. You know, it might be your best friend that you grew up with. Um, let them come and experience the games and be a part of it. Um, but don't come alone uh, because everybody wants you to be there and they want your family and they, they want to be a part of it with you. Great. Thank you. Eric, do you have any, any perspective to offer on this from your, uh, from your position as a clinician with 20 years experience working with the military community? Well, well, well let, let, me, let me take that as an opportunity first to say a few words, if you allow me. Uh, I've been listening in for the last two, two hours or so. I think we started a little bit earlier or later. Uh, uh, this is a great initiative. We could read all these things and to see people alive that, that share these conversations about the Invictus is just great. It, it echoes so many of the things that we care for and we, 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 we care about, especially in these, in these days. That's, I think it's, it's really important. Um, and, and I still see we have over 200 people attending at this event is, is, is great. We don't hear anybody. <laughs> it's kind of quiet in my, in my office, little office here, but, um, 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 no, I think um, um, what, echoing what, what the Air Commodore just said, uh, the, the, the three R's, resilience is one of the R's that, that, we, um, that we care for. And I, I enjoyed very much the presentation about Molly about, about resiliency and sustainable impact and, and the lived experience and, and also the bringing your family members. I think that is, um, this is a, a collective effort. That um, that um, you know, but but also just take one step back. Otherwise, I go to 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 my end point maybe for my first comment. Is um, no, I'll, I'll give it back to you and I'll I'll pause on it and I'll come back in the second one. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you. We'll we'll just move move on to another question. There's another one actually from Alexandra Heber. Uh, this one from Matt, um, and then maybe we'll go to to Dominic after that. Um, the question is, so back, uh, da, 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 peer support can help ameliorate the stresses uh, that, if not attended to, can lead to more serious mental health issues. Through mutual support and positive identification, peer support groups facilitate growth and resilience. This is especially true when peer support is taken seriously and formalized with trained peer support facilitators who are also provided with support themselves. Peer support groups like this can also connect their members to more formal mental health care when needed. Uh, I base this, base this on almost 20 years of formalized peer support for our serving military members and veterans in Canada. Uh, Matthew, would you have any comments on that? No, absolutely agreed. And, and during my time on the cover commission, just as, as a bit of an aside, every visit we, we made over 18 months revealed the true power in the formally trained peer support specialists within uh, the VA and VHA system. One of the difficulties, or I would say opportunities we faced uh, in engaging with our peer networks, which include Team Rubicon, Red, White, and Blue, and the others you saw listed was, how do we resource them and empower them to make safe and effective decisions without really intruding upon their core mission, which is very uh, distinct and obviously uh, demanding for so many of them. So, um, which is why we we can we built and uh, funded and resourced the connection center so it alleviates them of the burden but in the i guess in the daily practice of doing what they do if they meet somebody in their normal peer-to-peer -peer conversations friends helping friends if they look like they're in need we just afford them really what's uh not an easy button but but a button that can be uh, a call that can be made to at least help engage into that initial pathway into care. So I appreciate that question and agree that the power of peer is, is so incredibly important. Dominic? And I love that, that notion of, of, of formally trained peer support. I mean, it, there's, there's something in that about, you know, that, that sort of immediate cultural sensitivity about knowing where they're coming from, what they're about, and, and, and then having that support and having that training to, to, to deliver it. I mean, I'd just like to say that I think that the presentations this afternoon have been extraordinarily good. I mean, Tish and Molly and Matthew, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely fantastic. We're doing exactly what we wanted to do, which is to share best practice and to engage, um, in, engage in really interesting conversation. 
And, and the thing that I think we shouldn't lose sight of, as far as Invictus is concerned, is we started life as an event and we, we become a community. And, and we're, we're really sort of moving along in that process. We're moving along quite quickly in, in, in some ways, but actually moving from an event to a community, that, that, that tribal resilience, that Invictus family, I mean, very powerful what you were saying, Tish, about the family, but I think really important that, that, that as, as Michelle Partington said on the, um, on, on the chat while we were, we were talking, um, you know, sometimes it isn't your family, it isn't your blood family necessarily, it's the, it's the Invictus family around you. So it's that community, it's building that, it's making that as open and as welcoming and as supportive as we can make it. And I, think, I think what's happening this afternoon is a really, a really good move along that path, which is, which is great to see. Sorry, thank you. Stuart, I, I thought we might slide across to you um, from the perspective of you know, perhaps telling us a little bit about the X Forces initiative with FDM Group and, and linking also to the um, to this peer support question, which I'm sure probably plays some part in in your ability to help people into employment. Sort of pick up on the, the whole tribe piece, uh, the peer support, and effectively what you call in the in the forces the sort of buddy buddy system. And I think. Um, what I would look at as to the number of people that we've put through our program and the number of people that we've got out on site and working is that sense of purpose that they've derived from having uh, gone through that journey with us because we recruit people, we train them, and then we give them a job. And everything that everybody's talked about that I've uh, heard about is really sort of reinforced everything that I see from the way that the vets actually work together when they're actually out either in the community, uh, on site, working with our clients, or indeed when they're mixing with themselves. It comes back to that trust that they engendered right from day one that when they joined the forces. And that becomes part of their family, Trish, your point, very much so. And yes, it builds on that as they go through the next stage of their journey. Uh, a lot of what we do is at the end of, of their recovery where they're in a position that they can actually uh, start to have gainful employment. What we do find as well is that when people go out on site and of those sort of 500 and we're about 580 people now have been through the program. Those people that have gone out on site, we've had about 26, 27 people who thought they'd got to the end of their recovery and that they were uh, able to take the next steps to suddenly find that um, something triggered PTSD. And so being able to put our arms around them and to wrap them back into the community and look after them it it really just reinforces everything that everybody has said about the tribe about the family uh, the peer support and and that sort of um i suppose um alumni as to once you've served you've always served and therefore there is always somebody who's going to uh, look after you um and in whatever direction that might be Sure, thank you. I, there's just playing further on the on the peer support theme. We've got a question from Natasha Dupuy, which is for Matthew. Um, being in the peer support business, I would like to he to hear Matthew elaborate on the importance of lived experience as a key element of this model. Uh, I thought maybe Matthew, and then perhaps um, uh, I'll see if Rich, if you have any comments as well. I'll just, uh, I think, and I, I appreciate that. I, I think um, that's revealed in three ways. Again, during the time uh, on the cover commission in, in the VA structure, a peer support specialist, one of the functional mandates of being employed or hired into that role is that you have a bit of a lived experience in that, you, in that which you pay it forward to others. Um, specific to our Team 43 network, um, much like what we're talking about today, everybody who is within and welcomed into Team 43 is either wounded, ill, or injured in post-9-11 combat or service. And so what it reveals is there are small cohorts uh, denominated by the year that they're involved in the events, um, but it grows beyond that. Um, and I think what it does reveal then, especially with Chris Turner, which I mentioned in that Portraits of Courage, he then for the first time amongst others who had his shared and lived experience felt comfortable sharing his story, but not only sharing his story as an end, but sharing his story as a beginning. And that is the beginning journey that I think uh, Bertrand uh, mentioned. And that was the beginning journey in engaging in his own self-care so he could be the best leader he could be and then pay it forward for those who followed him. So. I hope that precisely answers your question, but um, 
absolutely the lived experience is a very material sub element to our warrior wellness alliance this is where we're engaging in those peers uniquely identified in each one of those peer networks uh, to help empower and uh, position people to begin seeking their own care Matthew, thanks it'll be interesting rich to hear your views as a clinician and the role that peer support can play in supporting somebody through their difficulties uh, David, thanks. It's a, it's a real privilege to try and answer a question from a co-captain of the Canadian team. So uh, I take my hat off to Natasha. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I've got two observations, if I may. Um, the first thing is, I think um, all of us in the clinical space would really like to see peer support as business as usual, and actually nothing special. This should happen all of the time. And the academic literature is very interesting around different levels of peer support. And I absolutely agree that the lived experience is, is really, really important. Uh, the Peyton Stress Shield talks about resilience buddy to buddy, but also resilience within the wider team and then the wider organization. And uh, this is why we're very lucky in Warrior Care that we now have the full buy-in of the chain of command as well. So they want to hear these lived experience stories about how the people involved and their families could be better supported moving forwards. And I think Alexandra also raised a great point in her question about the importance of not using peer support instead of properly resourced uh, clinical help where that's required. So the peer support needs to be a signpost into specialist services for those colleagues who need that support and shouldn't be used instead of. I think they're my two thoughts, David, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I think just, um, if we've got time for one more question, I think, um, for Tish, and then maybe go to Molly uh, after that. Um, Tish, you, you talked about, or I, I mentioned in your, um, in your introduction, the Friends, the Family and Friends Programme at the Games and how it's evolved over the years. Um, can you tell us a little about the effects you have seen? Uh, it's been a, a, an amazing program to watch grow. And I think um, the greatest thing for me to see is that the concept of family and the importance of family um, being with that competitor, that athlete, and being on that journey together has, it's a big thing in the United States, and we talk a lot about it. But to see it evolve over all these nations um, internationally, many of which maybe never had their family as part of that process. Uh, because of that service member veteran, when they know that their family is going to be okay, they're able to focus on themselves and they don't feel bad about trying to do some of those things that are going to help them on that path. So when we can take care of these families um, and, and, and make that possible, everybody's healing. But truly, the, the growth of the program, that it is not just something happening in the United States, but that it has truly blossomed and, um, and become very much an international spectacle, in my opinion. Thanks, Tish. Molly, any thoughts on the role of families in, in supporting people through their challenge, challenging times? Yeah, I, I second Tish on uh, how do you define families and, and how we kind of structured this as, as storytelling, right? Looking at that story that you're telling yourself that that family needs to be blood and then expanding beyond that. And then echoing Rich's point as well, I think it really is important um, to be looking at how all of these pieces come together and, and so one of the roles of both peer and family support is destigmatizing um, need for clinical supports and services when those are appropriate. Um, humans are complex. And um, even with the needs, I think sometimes people wanna march through. So they think, oh, safety first, and then belonging, and then purpose, and then competence. And, and there's just a lot of different access points. So what we're trying to do is give as many access points as possible, because some people might start their healing journey through purpose and others through connection. There's through that, that competence that they can get, you know, with Invictus Games offers all of those, but there's, there's a lot of um, paths forward. And so I would just encourage to, to really be looking at this and this and this and continue to increase those supports across the board. Molly, thank you very much. I think that's a great way to draw the panel to a close as we're sadly out of time. We've got more questions than we've got time to answer them, um, which is a good problem to have, I guess. Um, Thank you everybody for all your questions. There, there are far too many for us to answer now. Uh, and to the panel for your time and for your answers. It really has been a fascinating session which we could have taken on much, much longer. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're now gonna bring the Invictus Games conversation to a close. Uh, and I think 
certainly from where I've been sitting, it's been a really great event to have been part of, and I hope that you have all felt, you all feel the same. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I must thank all our speakers and panel guests, and of course, all of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, across the world who've taken part. Thank you for participating. You have asked some really good questions, and as I mentioned at the start of the afternoon, uh, those questions we didn't have time to answer verbally today, we will answer in writing over the coming days and come back to you with those. We, I, we hope that today really has made some progress uh, in sharing the Invictus spirit uh, and in activating what can only be described as an, a remarkable network of incredible people, uh, all connected by the Invictus Games. Uh, and looking forward, we will explore whether we should uh, run some more virtual events more frequently to connect you uh, in between the major games events. Your views on that will be valuable. So if you have any while I'm, uh, uh, we're closing today, please pop them on the chat function as we close. I've really enjoyed being with you again today. Thank you for being part of this. And finally, I wish to hand over the screen to uh, Richard Smith, who was the Chief Operating Officer of the Invictus Games Foundation. I might add that over 30 years ago, Richard and I were partners in the Jungle Warfare Instructors course in Brunei. And when life returns to something approaching normal, if you find a quiet time and buy me a beer, I'll tell you all about his jungle exploits. But in the meantime, uh, thank you for today. And Richard, over to you to close. Uh, David, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to close with a, to be able to close with a few concluding remarks um, on behalf of the Invictus Games Foundation. And what's great is that we've had over 300 people who've attended and registered uh, and taking part, taken part today, which is as many, if not more, than we hoped would have attended the event if it had taken place as we'd planned last Friday. Um, now, when we planned the conversation, uh, we were basing it on the two aims of identifying best practice and sharing, and also sharing the Invictus spirit, which a number of speakers have alluded today. And we see that as being built on the tang a tangible community, uh, including wounded, injured, sick, family and friends, team staff, and the 20 participating nations who are a part of the Invictus Games. Also based on the common values we share, a sense of service, uh, resilience, and as Dominic referred to, acting as a beacon for others to follow. Um, it's just been an amazing uh, event, an amazing thing to be part of. And to see the videos which we had from the participating nations were just awe-inspiring. And it can only fill, it certainly filled me, I'm sure all of you, with just huge enthusiasm and commitment uh, to be in The Hague next year uh, alongside Mark, Connie and, her, and their teams uh, who will bring an amazing games next year. And the other thing it just showed us is again that resilience and that burning spirit burning so brightly during the current coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. Um, there are a number of themes I'd just like to touch on, which I think came out from uh, the various presentations, and they're all common, and I think they just struck us all. The first one is the journey. Uh, and the journey is based on personal goals. And another theme which came out is that journey starts before the games, based on personal aims and objectives. It continues through the games, which is clearly a milestone, and then carries on beyond the games. Uh, and indeed, that's something which the IGF is really, the Invictus Games Foundation is really keen to develop with you, is the opportunities beyond the games. So the games are just a milestone, and we build that community and opportunities together. And a really key point which came out was looking after those who aren't successful, uh, aren't successful in making the teams because they're just as important um, in looking after them and supporting them with opportunities as well. A second key theme I think was, this is clearly all about people, the human element. Uh, the theme which came out was, you know, get on the front foot, taking control, surviving together and thriving together was another uh, really key um, sort of storyline or theme which came out. Family and friends was just so powerfully um, articulated to us by, by Tish. Delaying, sorry, dealing with the unexpected 
and the unimaginable. Um, and that the family is central to the healing process uh, and healing together as a family so that um, the, everyone can adapt and thrive together to the new normal. The next theme, I think, was community, linking relevant organisations with great initiatives such as the Warrior Wellness Alliance. The importance of communicating, breaking down barriers and sharing and the importance of peer support networks. And at the IGF, uh, we um, have been developing a wounded, injured and sick notice board application. It's available not just for competitors, but for all members of that community. And please, if you do would like to share in that, please get in touch with us at the IGF. Uh, it's a way, again, of bringing that community, which is so important, together. And also, we're working very closely with the team in The Hague to build a series of virtual activities between now and the Games next year to maintain that momentum and sense of excitement as we go forward to The Hague next year. And the final theme is that of legacy or future impact. It should drive everything we do, uh, planning early so that we can increase understanding and awareness of our wounded, injured and sick community and also the family and friends. And so that tangible outcomes and impact is absolutely central. As David has said, this is the first um, if such event that we've run and we hope that it will be a, a lead to a series um, of um, events and webinars on which we'd really uh, hugely um, uh, be grateful for your feedback. Um, and indeed, we'll be running this conversation again uh, at the start of the Games next year, where we hope we will develop many of the themes we've done today, uh, but also um, learn the lessons uh, as over this intervening year, including of how we've all coped uh, with the coronavirus pandemic and the resilience we've shown in so doing. We will provide a report and slides. Straight after this, uh, the, you'll find a survey, uh, where you'll receive a survey, and we'd be really grateful if you could complete that because we'd really welcome your feedback uh, in designing future events. And my final thing I'd like to say is just a, a huge thanks. A thanks to all of you for taking the time to attend uh, this event and this conversation. And I think it has genuinely been a conversation to thank the speakers um, who have just been uh, amazing. Blair, Ben, Molly, Tish and Matthew, thank you for taking the time for sharing um, all your great thoughts, moving thoughts, personal thoughts with us. Uh, and you've given us so much to think about as we take forward and we go forward again on this journey together as a community. David, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, um, uh, I'll look forward to um, putting the uh, story straight about the jungle exploits as well before you get carried away. Um, and also, I'd like to just thank Sam Newell and Hannah Fisher. They've been the masterminds behind the scenes who have actually pulled this all together. They've done all the technical work, all the invitations, the registrations, and without them, this wouldn't have happened. So Sam and Hannah, thank you very much indeed. Uh, to everybody and to you, thank you again for attending. Uh, stay safe and look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks very much.